Hi guys, it's me again, Katy Solange. Uh, I'm back and for those that don't know me yet, I do true life crime. I drink my vino because with my friends I drink good vino or just vino or just vino or just drink. Anyway, there's vino involved and I do my makeup at the same time. All the products that I'm going to be using, it'll be the description. No, 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 hold on. I should know this intro by now, right? So all the products that I'm using will be in the description below. Do let me know if you have any questions. Don't forget the usual routine, the liking, the make a comment, put something on my page, all of these things that I keep asking for. And so I know to carry on and that you guys are enjoying my videos. So to start today, um, I'm going to talk about this person they're obviously evil because they're evil. I'm not going to talk about someone nice, am I? Actually, I've done one that was quite nice. But anyway, moving on. His name is Bobby Joe. He's an American serial killer and serial rapist. Okay. And he did at least 50 rapes and 10 very, very, very horrific murders. And as usual, I'm going to start talking about his childhood and then moving on to what he's done. I hope you like this story. I'm going to turn up without makeup now, okay? You guys ready? See you in a bit. Look, everyone, I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't done this for a while. Today is the story about Robert Joseph Long, also known as Bobby Joe Long. And we'll call him Bobby, because that's what they used to call him. He was born in October the 14th, 1953, in Canova. <clears throat> Starting. Canova, West Virginia. Well, you could say that Bobby had a few hiccups growing up. He was born with an extra X chromosome um, specific variant, which the name I cannot ever say it properly, but I'll give it a go. It's Klinfelter syndrome, something like that, uh, which meant it gave him uh, some female traits such as um, big breasts. And uh, because of that, he was constantly being bullied at school. He didn't just have a little, like a little, little thing. He had like proper, uh, for his age, breasts, if he was a girl. So he was very bullied at school. It was said that when they would go swimming, because there was a river there, and in the summer they would all go swimming, everyone from the school, friends, um, and he would never take his clothes off. His mum separated from uh, his dad when he was two years old. They moved and she tried to get a few jobs in restaurants and during the day for the hours that he was at school. But unfortunately, that wasn't enough uh, money for them to live on. And she then decided to take up a bar, work, which she paid more at the time. The thing is, his mum was very, very, very pretty, very attractive. She was quite young, according to people that knew her. She had men following her everywhere. She was very, she was very fit and she dressed very fit too, which made Bobby very, very uncomfortable and angry at her. He, did, he wanted his mother's attention. He didn't want his mum to be known as the whoring town, which wasn't the case. She was just simply young, single and sexy. So the house only had one room. So what she did was she would share her bed with her son. This was up until uh, he was 13 years old. Now, the other thing that really infuriated Bobby was that sometimes after her shift of work or if she went out to the bars was she would bring men home and she would wake up Bobby and she would ask him to go and sleep on the sofa. Well, you know, she wasn't going to do it in front of her son. So, uh, you know, that, that's okay, I think, like bring men home, but, you know, put, the, put your kids in the other room but to do what you have to do. But... Of course he didn't like that. So he had a really, really bad relationship with his mum. They they fought a lot and the arguments would get really, really heated. 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 Ah, come on, I'm going to get drunk really quick today. You watch, watch this space. Mm. So the other things that kept happening, and I say things because it is things that kept happening to him, 
was he kept having head injuries. And we all know, well, head injuries through the childhood. Well, let's say that person is going to be a little bit... I'm trying to be nice today. I'm trying to come back and be nice. But he is evil, so... Okay, let's just say that he would be a troubled soul. Be nice. For example, he fell off a swing and... He had the sticks sticking out of his eye. That was one head injury. There was another time where he was a little kid and a car ran him over and he landed, he flipped and he landed on his head. Again, he wasn't well for a few days or who knows, forever. So he had a few head injuries. So you can see like the pattern of him growing up and the little traits that I am showing you that he had the head injuries, the head with the mom. But anyway, let's carry on telling his story. At about at the age of 13, in high school, he's met his sweetheart, Cynthia Bartlett, who he would soon marry. Now with Cynthia, oh, Jesus, no, 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 hold on. Mm. Let me put in the other one too, who knows, it might work a little bit later. Woo, wow, green it is. Cynthia has a documentary on TV that I also watched and one of the things that she talks about in the documentary is the hatred that Bobby has for his mum and how much he hated his mum and therefore women and he didn't respect women and he was also very possessive of Cynthia like she said that if they would go to the park she was a little bit worried if any guy looked at her uh, he would start a fight with them. No one could look at her. He enrolled in the army. He was very happy there. And eventually they got married in 1974. He was really happy in the army and being a married man. After six months, he was driving his motorbike. And unfortunately, he had an accident. When the motorbike crashed, he shattered his helmet. So it was a really, really, really bad fall on his head again. He was taken into hospital. And he was there quite a bit for quite a long time. And it was then that um, Cynthia started noticing straight away this strange behavior from, from him. So, for example, to start straight away, even in the hospital, the smells were getting to him, the food. And he became completely obsessed with sex. Like he needed to relief, he needed to orgasm all the time. While still in a cast, she would come in to visit him daily and he would ask her to have sex with him. In the hospital, she would have to have sex with him. Also, the nurses, when they were interviewed, they said that at least he would masturbate five times a day. That's the times that they saw. Imagine like the times that they didn't see. But on the top of that as well, um, he said to have these blinding headaches, really, really, really bad ones. And also, he could turn, it could be really, really hard. You just turn into a violent rage for no reason at all. He just could not control his anger. He was obviously oblivious to it because he was feeling all these feelings. But obviously, the people following um, his progress in the hospital and also his wife could see how he was changing so quick. But even with all of that happening, um, they carried on their married life and they ended up having two children. Uh, to which Cynthia says he was a very devoted father. He did everything with them. He took them to the park, the swings. He was teaching them how to swim. And he was a really good, devoted father and a good husband, apparently in the first few years. And then the the uh, youngest daughter turned two years old and something in him just switched to where he completely ignored the kids. He didn't care about the kids anymore. And not just that, he started being quite violent towards Cynthia. Like if she couldn't go anywhere, he was very possessive. And any argument that they would start, the two of them... He would slap her about, he would throw her on the floor and just slap her, slap her, slap her. Sometimes he would put his hands around her neck to the point where she just learned to be quiet and not question anything and not start an argument. She just started being really, really scared. To top it all off, even more, I know, there's, there's always more. He, his sex drive just went through the roof again. 
So apparently he wanted sex with her at least five times a day. So there were times that she was too tired and she would say to him, look, enough, uh, you know, we've done it a few times. And um, eventually what he did was he started taking it. Um, he started sexually assaulting her and she could be on the bed screaming, please don't do this, please, this is wrong, I'm your wife. And apparently his eyes would just go black. And to her, that was even worse because... She was like she didn't recognize her husband and she was too scared of what he would do. So every time he wanted sex, she would try and give it to him because it was better than being humiliated when he just went and took it himself. With all of this that was happening in her life, uh, we've got to remember that the doctor that was taking care of him after the head injury was still seeing him, was still seeing his progress and everything. So Cynthia told the doctor all these things about how much sex he was asking for, uh, that he forced himself on her, that he didn't, want, he didn't care about her or the kids. And uh, the doctor just said, it's okay, just bear with him. He'll get back to normal soon. Can you imagine your husband is sexually assaulting you and you're telling someone and all he says is, just bear with it, just do your wife duties and, you know, he'll be fine soon. How crazy is that? So the poor woman, there was a lot going on with her life. She started noticing something else that Bobby started doing. So he would sit on his chair in the corner, reading his newspaper first thing in the morning. With his pen, he would start marking things on the newspaper and he would turn to her and just go, I've got to go. I've got to go. I'll be back in a bit. And she said sometimes he'd be gone for afternoons. Normally it would be like two or three hours, but there was time he would be gone. Huh? Times they would be gone for longer than that. And that, that became a pattern. She didn't really understand why, but also she knew not to ask by then. So during her worries that her husband was disappearing for hours without end, the police also had a few new worries. There was a someone assaulting women in their house. According to these women, the men would answer their ads in the newspaper that they were selling for small appliances like furniture and anything like that. And the men will come in the house to see, let's say, the bed. And as soon as he made sure that they were alone, that's when he would then sexually assault them. You're connecting the dots here, right? That he was the person doing this in the police's eyes was nicknamed as the classified at rapist. They were looking for him everywhere. It's carrying on on the poor wife, Cynthia. And there was one day that he came home and he had a bit of an attitude and they started arguing and she did answer back a little bit. I can't remember what it was for, but what happened was it got so heated that he started throwing her across the room and it got a lot worse than that. So Basically, the last thing she remembers is him putting his hands around her. She woke up from him almost strangling her. And when she woke up, she just felt like blood on her face. She had a cut here and she's like, what have you done? Um, I need stitches. Please take me to the hospital. I need stitches. And he refused to take her to the hospital. She had to go and drive herself to the hospital. And he told her, don't you dare say anything. Of what happened at the hospital she got there she was seen straight away and she told the doctor uh, what the marks were and the marks were she fell onto a door and uh, the doctor looked at her and said look you're gonna need stitches can you wait a minute and I'll just go and I'll get the um, the thing to numb you up so just wait there a moment uh, when he walked out Probably like two minutes later, a police officer comes in and the police officer says to her, what happened to you? She again tells the same story, you know, walked into a door as they normally do, bless them, because she was petrified that he would, he would kill her if she told the truth. And the uh, police officer grabbed a mirror, kind of like this one, and said to her, here, have a look at the mirror. And she looked at the mirror and he said, did the mirror have hands? Now, here around the neck were the fingerprints, the handprints 
Bobby's handprints there, but so black, so dark, so you could you you could take a fingerprint from how, 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 how noticeable they were around the neck. So then she just looked at him and she wouldn't say anything. And he said, "Look, you have you have I have to go and arrest him. It's your husband, isn't it?" And she went, "No, please don't arrest him because by the time I get home, he's out and he'll kill me." So the police officer said, okay, I'll make you a deal. I'll give you a week. I will go to your house in a week. And if you're not divorced, then I will arrest him. She got his precious shotgun and she went into the room where he was asleep, pointed at his head, and apparently she was there for like two or three hours just trying to pull the trigger and she wasn't able. She couldn't do it because she was worried what would happen to the kids with him dead and her in prison. And then the alarm went off and she's there with a the gun and the alarm goes off and she's in a panic and he just looked at her, quote, Go ahead, bitch. You don't have the balls. And then she just turned to him and said, I want the divorce. I want you out. I want the divorce. And he went, okay, I'll do it. So he agreed to do it and he slowly started moving his things out. When I say slowly started is because... He would only take a few things at the time and not all of them. And then every time he came into the house to get the rest of his things, he would be there waiting for her. He would ask the kids to go and play outside. He would take Cynthia up to the room, sexually abuse her, beat her up, and then he would leave every single time. Uh, on Cynthia, what I watched, the documentary that Cynthia did, not Cynthia, sorry, Cynthia, um, she didn't say anything because she knew eventually he would fully move out and saying something, it would just enrage him and she didn't want to die, basically. So she went through that for a, quite a while. Eventually, Bobby decided to move to Tampa Bay in 1983. And then soon after, in 1984, these horrific crimes started happening in Tampa Bay. Again, connecting dots. Now, these crimes were horrific. It was just, it, it was no longer just rapes. These were brutal murders, brutal sexual assaults, kidnapping, and it would always bound them. They would leave their bodies to be found all spread out like an eagle, and it, it was all horrific. At night time, he would stalk his victims just to know their pattern, how they got home, and things like that. Then he would force them into his car with a gun, tie their hands, and he would blindfold them. Many of these women were, uh, were they worked in sex, uh, or they were dancers, or they worked the streets, but there were some that were not. If he just had the opportunity of someone working at night, then he would stalk them and kidnap them and torture them for hours and hours, if not days. The FBI was involved and other law enforcement, like local law enforcement, were investigating and they could just not get this guy or any clue who he was. Or they, they just didn't know who he was until... I keep you waiting there. Uh, they finally had a breakthrough with the only victim that he kidnapped, that he let go. Her name is Lisa McVeigh. She was a very... is, sorry, but... The, Back then, she was a child, she was 17, she was super courageous, extremely clever, and managed to, to get away from him, and I'll explain why, okay? So, she was working at a bakery a cafe, and she finished work about 2 o'clock. She's riding back home, and she sees this, uh, this car, like, the car starts beeping at her, and she thought, this is very, very strange, why is this car doing this? And she ignored the car and just started going on a bike faster just to get away from that car. Later, this car facing facing the road with the headlights on and she starts pedaling. And all of a sudden, yank, he just took her off her bike and just dragged her to his car, blindfolded her, put the gun to her head and said, shut up and be quiet. And he drove to, to the house where, well, to, to this house. Now... She was blindfolded, okay, blindfolded like this, but she could see the lights because it was night time. So what Lisa did was she tried to memorize every turn, everything about the car. So if one day she would be found, 
should remember everything. So this was on the 3rd of November, 2 a.m., uh, 1984, they kidnapped her. So he takes her upstairs to his flat or house and straight away he just started to sexually assault her. But he also took her to, to have a shower and in the shower he would have moments where he would just like relax and start kissing her back. So she started noticing that, you know, he was pretending for a few seconds that he was like his girlfriend. And she started using that in her favor. So she just started saying to him, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry the girls have been mean to you. I won't be mean to you. I like you. Let's, let's, let's start again. I won't tell anyone. Things like that. And then he would get in a rage. But she kept trying to, to win him over. Uh, also, uh, one, one of those times that she was talking to him, she wanted to look like, touch his face because she couldn't see him but she wanted to touch so in that way she could see through her hands and he let her so she's touching his, his face and going you the two of us could be so good together let's just forget about what happened I won't tell anyone just please please what you need to do is please you've got to take me home and he's like no 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 and he's reacting and he's going crazy no no you've got to take me home because my father is very, very ill, and I'm the only one that can take care of him. We've got no one else. Please just let me take care of him every day, and I'll come home to you. I'll even introduce you. We can be boyfriend and girlfriend. She really got in his head. And by the way, just on a side note, there, there was no dad. Unfortunately, she didn't have a very good childhood either. She uh, was asked by her mom that didn't care much to go and live with her grandmother to help her grandmother when she got there she found out what helping the grandmother was the grandmother had a boyfriend and the boyfriend forced himself on her for three years and the grandmother knew and she tried to speak out and let's say to her mom look do you know what's happening to me please help me do you know what's happening in this house and her mother did nothing so there was no doubt there was a very horrible step grandfather and bad grandmother but moving on he started to have a soft spot for her and um, she just started putting fingerprints, fingerprints in everything that she could. So, for example, the toilet seat, she got right at the back and put fingerprints there. She put fingerprints all over the mirror. She put fingerprints everywhere. She took bits of her hair and hair clips and hid them as well. After 26 hours, he just ordered her to, to, to get ready to go and she was really worried and she was crying no please please no what have i done don't do this to me so he made her put the, one of his jackets on and his trousers and he starts driving a blindfold her again and she's sure that you know she's not going to live that she was going to be killed because i forgot to mention this he did tell her that he has done this before he hates women and he has killed before and that's that's what was going to happen to her so in the car she just kept saying why can't we be boyfriend and girlfriend why does it have to be so difficult please don't kill me my father please my father will not survive please can you don't kill me and then the car stopped and she was petrified and he got her out of the car and just said shut up shut up and he put her against this tree and he said just stay there you wait five minutes until you hear the car go and then you can move as soon as she heard the car go she took a blind off and she thought that she was free she ran straight to the grandmother's house and said i've been raped the grandmother didn't believe but because she was a missing teenager she had to call the police they didn't connect her case to the other cases that were happening when i say the other cases in eight months he managed to torture sexually assault and murder but he was still doing the sexual assaults from the ads in the newspaper. So, you know, he was a busy man, but they didn't connect anything with her because he never lived, he never let anyone live that he kidnapped. It was only when one of the um, special force someone officer <laughs> that was working in her case, but not also in her case, but also in the Bobby, well, the, the the person that was killing people that we know is Bobby he was working her case and also that one he started noticing like the things that were very similar like for example the way that she was bounded like the way that her hands were bounded together 
also she described like the inside of the car being red now the girls that were being murdered there was these red fibers that were being found uh, on their clothes all over their clothes so he starts seeing a few similarities and he just asked um, his boss to send off to the FBI her clothes to see if there was any connection with the other girls that were and that they no longer live his boss wasn't sure that you know there was a connection there and he was like oh no it's not in the budget and that detective actually said it doesn't matter that i take it out of my budget i really believe there's a connection here so they send it off and wouldn't you know where her jacket was covered in the same red fabric that they found in all the victims and they then started putting the case together and they started talking to Lisa and Lisa remembered everything. She remembered inside of the car what it was called. She remembered that on the way out from his house they stopped in an ATM machine very very close to his house as they came out and this led the police to identify the car that was used and and they start taking pictures of the people driving these cars there in the area. They show the picture to Lisa and she said, yeah, that's him there. That's Bobby. That's the one that took me and he was arrested. And if it wasn't for Lisa, I, we don't know if what would have happened or if he was arrested or we, we don't know. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you for your bravery at that age. Lisa today, just quickly, um, she's now a police officer, actually she's a sheriff and she says from that day that I was petrified and, um, you know, fighting for my life, I swore that would never happen and what would happen is uh, I will save people and that's what she did and he got arrested. When he was arrested, he didn't deny anything, if anything, he actually added two more murders that they didn't know about, they didn't find the bodies yet and connected it to him and guess what he also said that he was the ad rapist which they didn't know they wouldn't even found any they, they wouldn't even think it's him because he killed his victims all of them you know and you're talking about a lot of them a lot a lot of lies just gone right down the tube because of me you know in one way or another and it's not a good feeling it's not a pleasant feeling i'm not proud of anything i've done and the worst thing is, I don't understand why. I don't understand why. So the 24th of September, 1985, he received 26 life sentences without possibility of parole. You have to remember the rapes that he was doing. He was over 50 people, plus 10 murders, plus the kidnapping. Yeah, anyway, he's dead now. Uh, he was in prison for, for many, many, many years and he was just recently, um, yeah, he died by a lethal injection. And that, that is his story of this evil, evil, evil man. But I thought as well with this story, they'll pay some gratitude to Lisa and her bravery, still even today with her job. And also I wanted to talk about his wife and what she went through. Uh, if you guys want to watch any of the documentaries there, uh, Lisa has done a couple and the wife has also done, oh, I don't know, well, well, I saw one. Um, yeah, they're quite good if you want to understand a little bit more of that evil or, or not. So guys, I uh, have to thank you for the time here that you've spent with me. It was a long story. I, you know, I've missed so much doing this that I don't want it to finish. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And let me know. If you need any information about the makeup or if you want to talk about the story, don't be shy. Do put your comments and um, I'll, I'll reply. And again, thank you and I'll be seeing you in two weeks. Thank you. Bye. Ciao.